had a discussion in the comments of one of Grow's online courses a few months ago and uh, now I have the chance to meet you in person. We have exchanged briefly about uh, some of the practices we follow in our farms. You in Portugal, me in Greece. Um, you have a farm located in southern Portugal, correct? Yes, Quinta do Valdelama. It's uh, in the Algarve province of Portugal, uh, which is the southern coastal strip. And we're at the west end of that uh, coastal strip in the municipality of Lagos, uh, just uh, right on the edge between that municipality and Portimao, the river that comes from Monchique, the headland of our watershed. Uh, we're, uh, we abut the estuary where that river empties into the sea. So it's coastal, it's a limestone coastal plain um, with interesting kind of morphology. It's, uh, the top of the farm is a mont at about 50 meters and it goes right down to almost sea level. There's a north slope and a south slope and uh, it's a very interesting uh, place to be. But I, I was very curious to meet you because I imagine from what I've seen so far in the Grow community, uh, you're the one with the climate that's probably the most like ours, like hot summer Mediterranean mm -hmm. classification. So I, I, I grow olives in the northeastern coast of Greece, and uh, this is one of the northeast distribution of olives. Uh, it's quite high up, and uh, the only um, the way we are able to grow olives is because we have a native variety, which is uh, adapted to frost since many centuries. Mm -hmm. So this is a wild genotype, very old genotype, which have been grafted by our ancestors. So it's a very gentle slope, southern aspect. A lot of influence from warm winds coming from Africa through the Aegean. So you have those moist, salty winds, um, which by the way also influences the, the taste of our olive oil. You can get hints of saltiness and this is the expression of the terroir. Mm. Uh, we grow on uh, clay sand soils mm. and what we have been doing in almost the last 10 years is uh, applying principles of agroecology, mm -hmm. enhancing or ma organic matter, maintaining as much biodiversity as possible on the farm. Uh, it's not a big farm, it's about 7 hectares split over 15 spots around our village of Makri, ah. close to the town of Alexandrupoli. So I was, uh, I have installed about 40 sensors in the wider area, mm -hmm. soil moisture sensors, and uh, joined the group growth sensing mission. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of diversity in the readings that you're getting from these? Well, I can identify at least two, three different, uh, not soil types, but behaviors in the surface of the soil, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to soil texture and mm -hmm. stone content. Mm -hmm. um, as you go closer to the sea, you have more um, uh, softer soils and uh, more uh, clay content, where as you move 1,000, 1,300 meters off the shore, uh, you you start getting more stone, mm -hmm. uh, soils that are more difficult to work. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, what do you grow? Well, it's uh, like most uh, large, rather large family farms in our context. It's 43 hectares mm -hmm. with uh, very diverse. The lowlands is uh, flat. The part that's down by the sea, just above sea level, is pasture. And uh, it's pasturing cattle there. We don't have any cattle, it's uh, neighboring cattle that uh, for me it's regenerative for the land and we get manure and we get uh, bales also. We do haying operation on the pastures. Um, then there's a zone, the kind of transition zone that's between the lowland and uh, the dry upland, which is all rain fed uh, system. Uh, this middle zone is irrigated. We have a canal that runs right through the farm. So uh, that comes from you know, it's rainwater from a dam uh, 10 kilometers away. And we grow, uh, well, organic vegetables. We have uh, organic vegetable production of about a half a hectare um, in there. And also we're developing, we have some soft fruit trees. We have a little uh, food forest that we planted. That's, uh, oh, I don't know, in terms of square meters, uh, two. 2,000 square meters or something like that, but great diversity of tree species. Mm. And through this we've learned what trees uh, really work in our context and what trees not so much. We're affected by the medfly to 
significant extent. So they tend to get the soft fruits that come later in the season. So the earlier varieties of plums and peaches and things like that are better for us. It's interesting because uh, also the medfly also affects the olives, especially uh, there are some years that it can have two and three cycles of hatching during the summer. Mm -hmm. This depends on how moist, uh, what is the level of moisture in the atmosphere during the summer, mm -hmm. because when it's warm and moist into the tree canopy, this is favorable conditions for the eggs of the fly to hatch. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, especially for table edible olives, uh, this is um, this is an economic loss for the farmers because um, it affects. This is where acidity starts um, in the fruit. But do you still press those ones that are affected by the medfly for oil? Well, we try to discard uh, by hand by selecting by hand because this also affects the quality of the olive oil. So. Obviously, there is a way to heavily spray, but I don't think this works either because there are a lot of conventional farmers in the region who spray a lot, mm. but they still have the problem. And I think also the insect uh, gets adapted to the different types of chemicals over the years. But I was uh, trying to test the hypothesis that different tree species, especially red fruit bearing trees, would attract uh, birds who in turn uh, uh, eat the fly. Mm. But this of course is something that takes time and you need to find the right uh, trees that would fruit during the summer, mm -hmm. which is also kind of a challenge because mm. in the drier climates, um, um, fruits are, are on the trees in autumn where you are past the danger zone of the fly. Mm. So I believe that like a mixture of uh, plants and by looking um, the, to, to, at the farming ecosystem as a whole, then this can maybe provide some solutions. But these are the type of solutions that need to take place in large scale. And when you are fragmented, uh, small pieces of land, mm -hmm. then it's maybe more difficult to test and validate. Mm. But it's interesting, I guess you're unique among olive growers in that you you understand about polycultures, that polycultures are healthier than monoculture. Um, I don't know, I don't know in your context if that, in our context, it makes us kind of an oddball. But this is where I think permaculture, because we're known essentially as a permaculture farm, it was, that's how it all got started for me, it was with the first PDC we hosted. And uh, this is fundamental, you know, the idea that well, it's mimicking the way nature works, and nature doesn't work in monocultures. Nature, every function, if it's important, it should be supported by more than one species. And uh, um, I think in agroforestry, agroecology, it has the same kind of understanding. Uh, For me, what is key is like how to, of course, when you practice farming, uh, there are certain course and certain timetables uh, you need to follow. You need to follow the calendar of the crop. Mm -hmm. You need to follow the, some, some people follow the calendar, the lunar calendar, like, you know, the elements, observe the elements and then go with it and live with it. But I think, especially in the context of like all these big challenges that farming is facing today, or at least we became aware of uh, today, I think what is missing is uh, another level of analysis, uh, mm -hmm. another level of being able to keep uh, historical records, keep track of, uh, of those observations in a more quantified way. And this is why I think uh, this grow changing climate mission is interesting because at least with soil moisture, which is so something very basic mm -hmm. that we often have overlook, mm -hmm. it, it is a way to start experimenting and start ac ac accustom uh, getting accustomed to this culture of thinking. Yeah. Uh, of uh, working and living with the land. Yes, yes. It, this is why I got into the GROW project. Uh, this is why I'm so interested in these sensors. Uh, I think in permaculture there's a kind of, uh, well, it's also because of the, the culture that uh, is, is predominant in permaculture. It tends to be homestead scale, not extensive farms, uh, where, you know, you want to know your soil humidity, a permaculture teacher I had said, well, what do you got a finger for? You stick it in the soil and you know. But across 43 hectares, this is impossible. And uh, so I was very excited by the 
opportunity to place sensors in all these different locations around the farm with different microclimates and monitor in a systematic way the, the soil moisture and how it changes in the morning and in the afternoon, the, the south slope, southeast catches the sun and dew rising from the sea, the north slope completely different. So first of all, to get a baseline understanding of these microclimates on my farm. And then the interventions that we're doing. A lot of these good permaculture ideas, uh, patterns of uh, swales for moisture retention to catch. My goal is to, uh, to live entirely within the budget of rain that falls on our farm. Right now we're blessed with this resource of a canal and wells that never run out of water, but I think that that's, it has to be viewed as for now, maybe not forever. And I think this is a single major challenge for uh, farmers in the Mediterranean region. I have observed during my lifetime, like during the last 10, 12, 15 years, our region on the northeastern coast, this being a coastal region, used to be influenced by the, the coastal uh, climate and the moisture. Uh, we have passed from a, the southern limits of a temperate zone towards a straight on subtropical zone in northern Greece. So w subtropics used to be only up to Crete, the southern mm -hmm. islands. Mm -hmm. But now you see that this has extended to more than 350, 500 kilometers to the north. And uh, when we are talking about soils who are taking thousands of years to form, and they are mainly, like the, 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 the useful soil of the first 20, 30, 40 centimeters is influenced by uh, geology and climate. Well, your geology remains because it's so slow forming, but your climate changes. And when your climate changes, you have different rates of mineralization and different rates of uh, uh, the type of nutrients that are available to the plants. Now I'm growing a crop that has been there for centuries and now with the climate changing I think we are sitting in front of uh, a seminal change on how the trees will behave, how the local uh, economy will be able to adapt to it and how um, um, you know, the social and the cultural fabric of this region that has, you know, this olive grove has been feeding f hundreds of families for decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are all the type of hidden challenges that uh, many people tend to overlook. Mm -hmm. And I think drought is the single defining uh, um, feature, yeah. both in Portugal, in Greece, all over the Mediterranean. Yes, yes. In Portugal, um, where we are in the, in the south, uh, cork is a very important uh, crop. and um, That's an agroforestry. It's an agroforestry. It's a system called the Montado, mm. which is uh, a multifunctional, a polycultural system. Uh, but you know, the climax uh, species, kind of centerpiece, is the cork trees, which now are, uh, they're, they're failing, they're, uh, the cork. Well, the industry is also going down because of plastic bottle closures and mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, people think that, oh, save a tree, use a plastic cork, uh, oh, yeah. without realizing that it's, it's using corks that actually keeps the trees healthy in that ecology. But anyway, it's going down, they say, because of water stress. And um, of, co of course, it's going to be, re it's related to climate change, but I don't think it's just because of climate change. I think that it's practices of land management. You know, they go with uh, plows and uh, clean the earth, and, uh, and this results in much more rapid uh, desiccation of the soil. And all those supporting species that are around the corks are, are not there to retain the water. But anyway, again, the, the key issue is soil moisture retention. There's this theory and that theory about how best to accomplish it. And um, the proof of the pudding is in the taste, you know, it's like, Soil moisture, the actual, this metric, if we can all speak in that language, I think. Compare, I'm doing this, you're doing that, and how, uh, what's the result in terms of soil moisture retention? To reduce the desiccation rate after a rainfall or irrigation event, so that slow the desiccation and so that it never hits the wilting point, that's what we need to do. That's the common denominator. But also in the larger scale, I think, uh, like both Portugal and Greece are suffering by wildfires for about a quarter, one third of the year. Mm -hmm. um, 
thousands of hectares being lost and mm -hmm. lately also in Greece there are lives being lost um, and properties and it, it, it looks like um, the society and uh, administrators uh, only tend to focus on the on the response to those uh, disasters but it turns out that um, land management and especially soil moisture plays, plays a very crucial role in regulating those microclimates the water cycles at the local and regional level um, for example uh, it is a combination of the moisture and of the soil temperature we had this discussion uh, of how the sensor the temperature uh, sensor on the soil moisture sensor we are using is uh, giving different um, readings mm. com as compared to a thermometer that yeah. is on eye level height yeah. and this is because it is a whole different world down there there is less airflow um, there are differences that we tend to overlook and um, I didn't understand that I've been trying to correlate okay now we've got this fire hose of data coming uh, every 15 minutes every one of these sensors is spewing out uh, you know, for these four uh, metrics and uh, with 174 sensors now deployed on my farm, uh, do the math, it's a massive uh, data challenge. So I'm trying to make sense of it, but that was the first uh, thing that didn't make sense to me is why are these uh, temperature readings so uh, at, the, at the level of the soil so elevated compared to, I mean, high 40s and 50. Mm. We don't get temperatures like that even in the south of Portugal. So I'm correlating that to data from a weather station uh, nearby. It's time series data. The uh, I'm in way over my head on this <laughs> data analysis. That's why I'd really like to engage some help in that direction. But um, so I downsampled the 15-minute intervals to one-hour intervals to match the weather station, and yeah, they don't they don't correlate so well. Mm -hmm. But uh, you were explaining some of those dynamics that make for a higher uh, temperature at the level of the soil? This is the example explanation I can give at this stage um, and uh, it would make sense to me because when we are talking about soil microbiology they need this type of conditions of mm -hmm. you know above 50 degrees and mm -hmm. above mm -hmm. 40 degrees and uh, I think uh, what we experience as objects walking on the soil is a totally different yeah. condition of what these organisms uh, are experiencing down there. And I think this is the whole revolution that it can bring mm. into the, our understanding of, uh, of our lands and of our soils. For me, that was the first mm. big uh, uh, surprise, the big learning in, uh, it is a different world down there. So, so now this next step, uh, classification, I would say, or what we were explained yesterday, the, First of all, the landscape uh, survey and the soil texture and the management to classify all these different sites of these different sensors in terms of, in those terms, and correlate that information with the readings we're getting from the sensors. Mm. I'm, I'm just really excited about uh, learning at this, at this level of depth, a little deeper from the observations that I've made walking around the farm. You know, permaculture, the first principle is observe and interact. But I feel I'm doing that at a very gross, you know, unsophisticated level. And uh, I think it's the fourth principle is, is self-regulation, to seek and accept feedback to regulate yourself. But what feedback exactly? You know, there isn't, uh, there isn't so far much science about this in conversation in permaculture circles. But I feel like this is the beginning of uh, having that kind of substance to talk about. Like, uh, very exciting. I have to thank you for engaging with me on the on that future learn uh, the MOOC and and I saw a couple a few YouTube videos with you on the Grow Channel, and I thought right away, oh wow, here's one person that uh, understands. I kind of got into this through the academic uh, connection, a university in Lisbon, research project. Uh, you know, sounds kind of researchy and not that practical, but uh, you obviously have a solid understanding of why this is practical, how we can use it to improve our I'm health. looking forward to visiting your farm. I'm really looking forward to have you, to help me rescue our olive grove. And, uh, and we have hundreds of olive trees. That uh, That's a challenge I haven't yet got to, is bringing those back into production. But man, anytime.
Nice talking to you, Walt. Great. Thanks.